what Andy's talking about and what this conference is about, right there you see somebody who made a difference, not in his life, he made a difference in all of our lives. That's why you're here today. Our next speaker is uh, Rich Heidel, and you're in for a treat uh, when uh, we get Rich up here. We have to wait for Elaine because she's asked for a special dispensation to introduce Rich. <laughs> the reason I wanted to introduce Rich Heidel is because um, in the study of federal Indian policy, no reservation sits in a vacuum. They're all co-located in counties and towns and cities and dual jurisdictions. There's 1,370 counties, towns, and cities. And in the recent years, I'm not saying you know, gaming revenue for most states, um, and, and EPA or federal government overreaching, the tribal governments are pushing further and further out and overreaching and trying to remove or replace municipal authority, county, that kind of thing. And that was going on, that's been going on across the country. I got a offer I couldn't refuse from the village of Hobart, from Rich Heidel, and this was after a couple of emails and they invited me to come out and talk to the community. And I just upended, <laughs> it was the first time I upended my family, uh, my aunt closed down my office, closed down my teaching. I, I just thought what was happening to this one municipality was so important, I wanted to get out there and help. And so we moved out to Hobart, Wisconsin at Rich's invitation. And it's been an eight, it was an eight year joy. And I'm gonna let Rich talk about the rest of it, but the main reason I wanted to introduce Rich and the village of Hobart is in all my studies and searches so far, they remain. The only local government where all five elected officials are absolutely dedicated to preserving their municipal authority and protecting their property rights and their, and their residents. And you can call them any name that you want. They're not going to waver. Rich, come up here and give them up for <laughs> It was too generous. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> I wish we hadn't really reversed the orders of the speakers. I wish Andy would have had to follow me instead of I following him. Uh, because what I'm about to say is probably going to sound like overkill. Doesn't make it unimportant. But, uh, you know, Andy asks, you know, what else could he do? I have one bit of suggestion. I wouldn't use the term, have my ducks in a row any longer, because next thing you know, they'll be on you about some type of a waterfowl. So, uh, that's my one piece of advice, Andy, but you are one great American. You uh, got you, you, you are, <clears throat> every good American needs two body parts, a brain and a backbone. Um, the bad guys aren't short on brains. Uh, but the good guys need to assert more of their backbones. That, that's the difference. And uh, you have that in spades. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, establish two starting points. First of all, uh, I never heard of this guy until I was preparing the speech for today, but there's a cartoonist for the Los Angeles Times. Recently, he's been suspended. After I share with you, why, you know, the cartoon, you'll understand why, I guess. His name is Nixon Diaz. Uh, he recently had a cartoon that showed two characters talking with each other. The first character asked the second character, aren't you proud that we have a black president? Mm -hmm. The second character replied, not really. His mother's white, his father's Kenyan, he grew up in Indonesia and went to Muslim schools. He has about as much in common with black folk as white folks do with polar bears. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that while Barack Obama may be our first African-American president, he's also our 44th Caucasian president. Neither the US Supreme Court nor Bruce Jenner's surgeon or Rachel Dolezal uh, or any of the others can change that fact. <laughs> and uh, 
since we're talking about ethnicity and race, and in my view, I'm not the only one, that is what we're talking about when we talk about federal Indian policy. It's nothing but racism. Uh, I would like to state that I am a Native American. Amen. Me too. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not an American Indian, but I'm as native to America. I'm as native an American as anyone who is native to the country he was born in, the country he served, the country he protected, the country he gives his allegiance to. That makes me a Native American. So we need to redefine that term, and that's the proper definition. The second starting point, and this dovetails a little bit with what Andy was saying, is that I don't need permission from the government, state or federal, to stand here today and speak with you people and say the outlandish things that I'm going to say. I don't need their, their permission. One of the very simple but profound reasons why the United States of, an America, of America is an exceptional country is because for the first time in human history, first time ever, a governed people were seen as God-created sovereignties unto themselves who already had embodied fundamental rights given to them by God himself. Amen. Not by a king, not by an emperor, not by a committee, certainly not by a president. I am the third of four generations in my family, all who have served this nation. We've had POWs and casualties, uh, PTSD patients, uh, at, at a point in time when that was simply referred to as being shell-shocked, uh, a Green Beret, uh, an attendee at the U.S. Military Academy, and uh, I personally uh, played a role, a minor one, but in training the NYPD Police Commissioner on 9-11, Bernie Carrick. So we've all served this nation. Our family's not the only one. But throughout all of this, we did not serve a president, we did not serve a commanding officer. While we took orders from these individuals as part of our chain of command, their orders and our obedience there too were all in the name of defending and protecting the United States Constitution. Amen. It was this duty and only this duty to protect our Constitution that we swore to do when we took that oath to serve. Once taken, that oath does not expire. Amen. Wearing an American military uniform is but only one way of defending and protecting the Constitution. Though I no longer wear a uniform, I can't fit in it, <laughs> I am still defending and protecting the Constitution today in my role as a duly elected local official. For those of you who fill the same type of role, in your lives. I'd like to thank you for your service. I admire you. And it's a selfless job, but it has so much satisfaction, though, too, to play a role in this experiment we call American democracy. I speak today to you Americans in the exercise of my constitutional rights, specifically the right to free speech and to freely assemble. I protected these rights for Americans, and I intend to take full advantage of these rights myself, as I would allow any other American to do. I would much rather have my spoken and expressed ideas mocked and lambasted and ridiculed and criticized than have the spoken and expressed ideas of my opponents silenced. This is, after all, the free marketplace of ideas, a concept so central to the Constitution. The rights and provisions enumerated in the U.S. Constitution were grounded in the stated fundamental beliefs expressed 13 years earlier in the Declaration of Independence. In that earlier document, we find the familiar verbiage, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The authors believed in a higher power, in God. And they believed that our rights as human beings were endowed by that God to us, not by any human being, and certainly not by any government. 
we in turn, as members of the human race, not the red race, the brown race, the yellow race, the white race, the polka dot race, or any other race, we, the human race, are the ones who extend sovereignty to our government, our representatives, and consent that they act on our behalf and for our welfare. So, when we swear to protect and defend the U.S. Constitution, we're swearing to protect not just our way of life, but values that transcend nations and peoples. The entire book of human history is trashed with experiment after experiment of human despotism and human tyranny. 97% of all human beings that have ever walked this earth have done so under the force and brutality of some form of, of tyranny. Our constitution and way of life is far from perfect, but is also far from this tragic story of human suffering. It is this vision of human freedom, human capability, the human right to seek out opportunity and succeed that the Constitution recognizes and protects regardless of race. What man is trying to achieve apart from God will utterly fail. While we render to Caesar what is Caesar's, we remember that our calling is not based on any kingdom or nation that exists in our world. It is based on the transcendent truths and values of our Constitution and implemented as best we can as Americans. Now with those points having been made, I'll share some of my experience in Hobart, Wisconsin as the village president. We are a, municip we are a municipality of almost 8,000 citizens, some of whom are Oneida tribal members, but German Americans, Polish Americans, Belgian Americans, African Americans, Irish and French Americans, and so forth. As stated earlier, I'm a Native American. I have no interest in individuals' ancestries and ethnicities as an elected official. As far as I'm concerned, I have no obligation nor special duty to any individual other than those obligations that are commensurate <laughs> with that individual being of the human race and being an American. I have no use for hyphenated Americans. For example, German American, Hispanic American, and so forth. We know the litany. My sole regard for any American is simply that they are American, and my sole obligation as an elected official to any American is that I treat them as an American. No more, no less, but just as good. I can't tell you how repulsive it is for me to be told by the state or federal governments that our local government must provide services to all residents, but should not expect appropriate, equal, and accurate compensation from all property owners for those services because of their ethnicity. I can't tell you how repulsive it is for me to be told by the county or state governments that our local government cannot extend appropriate, equal, and responsive public safety services to all residents because some are American tribal members and somehow they're different and should only be served by the tribal police. I can't tell you how repulsive it is for me to be told by the state or federal governments that our stormwater management practices must be metered out on a checkerboard basis because some of our land mass is in federal trust on behalf of the Oneida Indian tribe and some of our land mass isn't. You know, whatever stormwater uh, management practices are good enough for one class of Americans, you'd think should be good enough for another. Uh, but perhaps Mother Earth knows the difference, I don't know. I, I can't tell you how repulsive it is to realize that all of these legal mechanisms are ultimately based on nothing more but a percentage blood quantum of some of our citizens. I, I couldn't possibly give a better definition of racism than that. The state and federal laws, mandates, and directives undercut the very pilings upon which our American Constitution is built and which it protects. That is what I mean when I say that we are constantly dealing with dysfunctional federal Indian policy, otherwise known as institutionalized racism. While many in tribal leaderships 
positions disagree with me, there are many tribal members themselves who completely agree. My best friend while on active duty in the Army was an American Indian from the Lakota Ray Band of the Lake Superior Chippewas in Wisconsin. There are countless American Indians who themselves are also repulsed by these dysfunctional policies. Our first two town chairman, in the, uh, at, the, at the time it was the town of Hobart, uh, 1908 was when we were first incorporated, uh, were both American Indians, Oneida tribal members. My goal as the chief elected official of our municipality is to ensure that all underlying all of our citizens are equally, fairly, and constitutionally treated. At one time in my life, I took an oath that I would die to protect that ideal. I'm still protecting it, and I'm still committed to securing it on a daily basis. I don't feel I need to explain or address the unsustainability of federal Indian policy, the endless subsidizing of almost 600 federally recognized Indian tribes across the nation to ever and ever larger degrees, mushrooming year after year. It's ludicrous to think of it as being anything other than unsustainable. It should be enough to attack the demerits of these policies solely on the basis of our American values and law. We once had a president who exhorted us to seek what we could do for our country, not what our country could do for us. Today, it's, liter it's literally the opposite exhortation that is heard from corner to corner of this generous nation. What our nation so desperately needs is to return to the politics of national interest, not the politics of divisiveness of class and the interests of special groups or ethnicities. I have to laugh when I think of the <clears throat> uh, prominence that diversity assumes uh, in the, uh, on the to-do list yeah. of the national agenda. Um, you know, we must provide diversity of race, diversity of sexual orientation, diversity of language, diversity of economic class, diversity of religion, and so forth. I'm a practicing Catholic. I'm married to a Jew. My father converted to Catholicism he had previously been Lutheran. One of my sister-in-laws is black American. One of my sisters has become a Baptist. One of my brothers has joined an Assembly of God congregation. We didn't need an act of Congress or an agency's rulemaking to realize this diversity. The good Lord and Mother Nature has provided more diversity around our own family table than the federal government that thrives on such programs and agencies. Our federal government believes it must secure and further the so-called diversity of every metric imaginable. Yet we're called the United States of America. Seems to me being united is a hell of a lot harder than trying to force diversity, which is going to happen anyway. Far too many politicians have mastered the fraud of taxing one group of citizens and bestowing this wealth on another class, all the while somehow justifying this on the basis of imagined or manipulated inequalities. This is victimization of those who deserve better and an insult to those who've done no wrong. This isn't contemplated by our Constitution, nor is it what made this nation so exceptional. Yet this is exactly what's going on. The disparity and unconstitutionality of one group of Americans as the aggrieved pitted against another group of Americans as the aggressors. The real scoundrels are the lawmakers themselves who seek nothing more but their own prosperity, their own power, their own prestige by foisting this nonsense on good, God-fearing, law-abiding, tax-paying Americans. This is an outrage that will someday catch up with them. They're nothing but unconvicted thugs. That's all this is. What I have found to be the magic potion to combat this deadly disease is a, a daily regimen of what I had mentioned earlier. 
the exercising of two body parts, a brain and a backbone. How often do we need to know what's right and then fail to act? Too often we lack the courage to do or say what needs to be done or said. More often than not, we know what the right thing is, what the constitutional precept is, but we fear being labeled as racist, as insensitive, as politically incorrect, as ignorant, uneducated, unrefined, or biased. It's natural to feel intimidated by a public, a press, or electronic media that levels these accusations against us with a deafening voice and seemingly overwhelming power and influence. But how can we live with our, ourselves without asserting our courage of conviction? All I can say is what Sam Adams once said, if ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude better than the animating contest of freedom, go home from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that you were ever a countryman. There goes Sam. My own experience at home in dealing with the United Tribe of Indians has evolved over the last 12 years. In 2003, I believed that the tribe was misunderstood and that they were truly aggrieved, and that no one was willing to work with them. Very soon after initiating or, or signing a first ever service agreement between the village of Obart and the Oneida tribe, I was snake bitten with how the tribe used this agreement at cross purposes with their stated intentions. A service agreement has meant really nothing more but to acknowledge that a tribe does not have to pay property taxes on land in federal trust, yet they acknowledge services that which are rendered to them and they, they pay in, in favor of those in lieu of, of taxes. The first ever service agreement defined how these services are to be calculated and compensated. What is in actuality <clears throat> uh, a payment in lieu of taxes? While the Oneida tribe agreed to render the agreed upon payment, it came with additional provisions and conditions. These provisions typically require that the receiving government must, must pledge not to challenge land going into federal trust. In our case, the tribe represented that they were not interested in applying to put fee-owned land into federal trust anyway. So the pledge of non-opposition was, was almost immaterial, irrelevant, unnecessary. Turned out this wasn't true. Also, the tribe was extremely delinquent in making its third and last year's annual service agreement payment. Near the end of the third year and the last year of the service agreement, the Oneida tribe understood that things might not go the way they desired with a renewed agreement. In one session, the tribe's chief attorney threatened us that the village of Hobart would be extinguished and needs to prepare for extinction. We never renewed nor renego renegotiated. My position became one that held that a service agreement is not necessary. All that equity demands is the submittal of an invoice by the municipal government and payment made by the tribe. Period paragraph. The Oneidas refuse this simple yet honest approach and hold the large annual service agreement payment as a carrot, thinking that we have no choice but to execute another agreement. They do this with good reason. They believe that the unknowing, uninformed voters, my constituents, our board's constituents, will question and criticize people like me for not having come to terms with the tribe and thereby forego this large payment. What are we, nuts? Why are we passing up on this money? I and my board for now, for eight years uh, now, have told the tribe that their money means nothing to us. If it means that we must comport with their authority and the federal government's enabling of this private play to pay government doesn't mean a damn thing to us. There are things far more important to us than their money, 
or the federal government's money and try to figure out which is the two, yeah. uh, our responsibilities as elected officials and our reverence for our constitutional underpinnings trump the tribe's money and the federal government's agenda all day long, any year. Good for you. Good for you. As, as a result, the tribe has lost all leverage with us and frankly don't know how to deal with us. They, they don't know how to deal with this refreshing, cold, and honest approach to government. The sad thing is that they learned this tactic, though, at the knee of the great white father. The tactic being that money will get you anything you want. Turning down any amount of money to preserve our freedom and authority as a duly constituted local government is what I mean by courage of conviction. We no longer fear whatever our critics may have to say or what the local newspaper may have to publish or editorialize, you'd be amazed and I was astounded at the degree of public support for our position. Using those two body parts, a brain and a backbone, will yield unbelievable results. In addition to tribal threats, <clears throat> we faced the name calling of a hostile news media. We were racists and homophobes. The world was told that Hobart couldn't get along with anyone. Not only did the media play the role of politically correct bullies, but so too did our local municipal governments. We were ostracized and ridiculed. Newspapers were replete with accounts of the village's contentiousness and our tendency to battle the tribe. Among other things, this presented a difficult situation for us when it came to borrow or bond money for legitimate municipal projects. Investors and underwriters perceived a higher than normal risk with our legal bills and potential of, lo of losing property tax base. If we succeeded in bonding, it came at a higher interest rate and uh, because of the perceived risks. We put on our big boy pants and took what we could get. We've paid back the bonds and in interest and in the process, we've earned the highest standard of poor's municipal credit rating awarded to a Wisconsin village of our size. My mantra was, and still is, I'm, I'm Catholic, but this comes from Martin Luther. Peace if possible, but truth at all costs. Uh, we have, in the last four years, there's almost 2,000 municipalities, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here, in the state of Wisconsin, uh, and much of this is with the uh, assistance and help uh, and skill of Elaine. But for uh, the past four years, we have ranked as the second fastest growing municipality in the entire state of Wisconsin on a population percentage basis. Uh, we have the second most successful uh, tax increment finance district. Uh, 2010, we accounted for 10% of all newly registered parcels of land in the state of Wisconsin. And uh, uh, we did this in the wake of some spiteful tactics by the tribe, which I'll get into here. Uh, in 2008, 300 acres of agricultural land came on the market. It's located along a four-lane highway and represents the best prime commercial real estate in all of the village's 33 square miles. We knew the Oneida tribe would be extremely active in their attempt to purchase this land. And there are no do-overs. Uh, so we got out in front of them, negotiated with the farm families who were selling, bonded for the land, bought it. However, our philosophy, of course, is that government's got no business owning land. So we felt we had no choice. It was a matter of survival. So we no sooner bought it, now we got to scratch our heads for how are we going to develop this? We've got to get it on the tax base. We're not landowners, we're not landlords. Uh, it was about that time when Elaine came on stage, and uh, we, in, in the midst of the nation's greatest economic environment, worst economic environment, 80 years, uh, this is what was playing out. We wanted to develop this land and add tax base. Immediately what had happened is after the purchase, 
<clears throat> and maybe some of you folks have heard this before. I had not heard of it until it happened to us. But the United Tribe purchased what realtors call a spite strip. Uh, the intention of the tribe was obvious. The shape, size, and location of the spite strip obstructed the village's plan to build necessary infrastructure. So again, we put on our big boy pants and we condemned the land. <laughs> we felt and we, it was legitimate. This was for public benefit, public use. The tribe sued us in federal court claiming that we could not condemn and uh, land because they own it, just because they own it. Our position was, and still is today, that we can condemn any land that's not in federal trust, regardless of who owns it. The federal judge ruled in our favor, and it's been off to the races ever since. Uh, I already recounted for you the successes we've had in terms of growth, the additional property tax has been uh, generated off that new tax base has more than exceeded what we had lost uh, in other lands going into federal trust, uh, which was our goal. You know, most municipalities don't have this kind of an issue. They do economic development because it sounds quiche and everybody wants to do economic development and so forth. In our case, it was survival. Well, we've, we've exceeded our own uh, wildest dreams. We have a new issue now, though. While the tribe can continue to purchase land and put it into federal trust, we can at least oppose applications to the BIA since we're not hogtied by a service agreement anymore. It, it's just such a wonderful feeling. Um, you know, the trick is to convince your constituents that this is the best thing in the long run. And we've had, a, we've had success in doing that as, as people become educated and they understand that we're trying to protect their properties and their values it had i can't i'm not going to claim that it was that difficult but it has to be done but we've had success because of that since 2009 despite several applications to the bia no additional land has been approved for federal trust so at least for the time being now six years seven years uh we've held them in, tr in check our belief is, is and Elaine and, and Lana is well familiar with this. Lana has been a huge assist with us as well with these uh, uh, litigations, but our belief is that this is due to the Supreme Court's carcieri decision. We believe that the BIA, the DOI, and the tribe are waiting for a legislative carcieri fix. Um, however, and, and, and true or not, a more insidious problem uh, faces us now. Uh, it's always been there, but in our case, it's really kind of rising to the top fairly quickly here because of our success and development. Um, the problem is that the tribe will continue to purchase land and failing to get it into federal trust will simply sit on it and pay uh, the relatively low property taxes that's, that are assessed on agricultural land typically, and that's what a lot of this is. So they, they don't like the idea that they have to pay taxes, but to them it's worth that and more for them to own it and basically just completely shut down and stymie all development. The only remedy for this, that this is me talking now, the only remedy I see for this is for the U.S. government to means test the tribes. Washington's U.S. Senator uh, Slade Gordon tried this, I guess, more than 10 years ago. And uh, we all know what happened to his reelection campaign, thanks to the uh, Washington State tribes. I just met uh, two weeks ago with our congressman about the possibility of drafting legislation that would means test American Indian tribes. Uh, I, I've got to continue working with him. I, obviously, he didn't understand, I don't think, what it was, because when I said means test, his jaw didn't fall to the floor. Um, if you understood what it means, as a polit politician on a national scale, you, you know this is not going to be easy. It's, it's, a, it's a cyanide pill, possibly. But uh, 
there are tribes, the, the Oneida tribe ranks probably in the top 10 tribes in the nation in terms of affluence and education. In my opinion, the ledger entries for past grievances have been balanced and the tribe no longer needs the great white father to pay its weekly allowance. Until the federal pipeline of money to American Indian tribes who have all kinds of casino revenues and federal subsidies already is capped and welded shut, mischief will continue to be visited upon law-abiding and generous Americans and their local and state governments. Um, when I mentioned this to our congressman, his first response was, well, the tribe has already had their funds curtailed. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? How'd that happen? Well, that 2% sequestration. <laughs> I said, okay, well, 2% of half a billion dollars, I guess, <laughs> might be something, but it's not going to stop the tribe. Uh, these guys need to understand. They need to get sized up for big boy pants. That's what they need. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, right now they take super small. <laughs> Too many of our elected and state officials are hiding under the skirts of political correctness and currying favorable public relations. As a symbol or as a token of his cooperation, um, as well as a means of upbraiding and reprimanding our village board's strong stance, six years ago our former county executive arbitrarily signed over almost 2,000 acres of municipal jurisdiction to be policed primarily by the United Tribal Police Department as deputized county sheriffs. This, of course, he based solely on the ethnicity of the residents in that portion of the village. This not only violates the concept of a municipal government's home rule, but as I mentioned earlier, it's racist. Our policies, our procedures, indeed our very DNA always mandate that we treat every citizen with equal protection, equal professionalism, equal rights without regard to skin color. If this wasn't unconstitutional or racist, it would actually come across as kind of sounding petty. We continue to oppose this situation to this day. On another issue, uh, which involves an abandoned railroad, uh, this railroad, the abandoned railroad, completely bisects our village from east to west. So, immediately think of Spite Strip. Uh, the tribe claims this land to be in federal trust. Never to have been allotted out by the Dawes Act. However, or, well their story flip-flops though too. Uh, sometimes it reverts back to trust, sometimes it's owned in simple fee. I mean they got belts, suspenders, diapers, everything else. It's whatever's going to work. Throw it up against the wall. Um, as a result of numerous FOIA requests, we submitted to the BIA, the DOI, not one iota of documentation substantiating this claim could be provided. Even more incriminating, in my view, is a BIA letter that we actually got stating that they never approved the land uh, going into federal trust. They acknowledged having the the application, but they never approved it. So anyway, we take that land now and we put it on the property tax rolls. So I think Elaine has mentioned that perhaps we're the only municipality in the country taking land from the tribes. Uh, but now they uh, have sued us for other reasons. We're awaiting a federal judge's verdict. Uh, today was day 30. Judge Griesbach said he'd have a ruling out by today within 30 days. I've not heard of anything yet. I know you, you ladies will as soon as I do. I have other examples here uh, of, of standing tall as local officials. That's what it's about. It's really standing tall as Americans. And uh, true Americans shouldn't really have a difficult time standing tall because Lord knows we've got everything to be thankful for, everything to fight for. Uh, and look at what everything has, has done and, and, and yielded us in terms of blessings as well. Um, I, I guess I'll close with, uh, with one phrase that American revolutionary parsons and ministers and reverends uh, always used to say, uh, you know, before throwing off their, their uh, preacher garb and uh, picking up their musket, may God prosper the cause. Thank you very much.